thank you very much, Diana, to be um, uh, hosting us here in the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics. It's an honor for us to still in research in the archive. It's a pleasure for us to have you back here again. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to do this interview. And if you want to cut on the middle of the question, no problem at all. Okay. It's not a formal. We, we, I'll try to make a conversation. It's Great. really formal here in my, my notebook. Right. My, in, but um, uh, I think you can jump in anytime you want. OK. The first question is a, is a really, uh, since we know 10 years, you and we met in Buenos Aires, I was, it's really personal. I would like to, for you to maybe to, to say a little uh, how you entered this performance thing. The world of performance? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. We read your books and we, we, we see a lot of concepts, but I'm really I'm using this opportunity of the interview to really yeah. curious to, to, to know how, does, how did it start? This? Well, it started when I was a young girl in the north of Mexico, and the community that I lived in was very, very close to an indigenous community, very famous, the Taro Mara. There were the group that Anton Arto went to visit like in 1938. And they would come to our town to buy their food and things like this a couple of times a year. And I understood when I was little that they had their own ways of doing things, their own practices, their own ways of dressing and using their hair, putting their hair and so forth. And I didn't understand it at all. And so that was really interesting. And it kind of was like this. And then the other thing that happened, also when I was little, was that I went to a wedding. And I didn't especially know the people. My family took me, you know. And people were crying. And even I started to cry at the wedding. And that was a question I'd always had my whole life, which is, why is it that certain kinds of ritualized behaviors will make you feel something that normally you don't feel? Because I didn't know those people. I wasn't happy or sad. or I was, I was completely indifferent to whether they got married or didn't get married. Right. So what is it about the ritual, about the, the organizing of action in a particular way that makes us channels, if you want, channels are emotional responses. So those were questions I had, and I could never understand them. And then when I was um, nine, I went to boarding school in Canada, and I didn't speak English, and it was like a very foreign experience. But I became very much in love with theater. And the first book, really, in English that I ever read was a Shakespeare play, The Merchant of Venice. And I had a terrible time with English. But I understood there was something that it was like, I understand this. I just understand this. And so my teacher, when I was talking about it, she said to the class, everybody else leave. The only person I want to talk to here is Vienna because she's the only one who understands. There was something, there was some innate thing where I kind of understood something about behavior that is codified in particular ways. And even if I didn't understand it, like with the Tardo Mara, I didn't understand what those codes were. But I knew that there were codes. I knew that there were codes and that I couldn't understand them. It wasn't simple. It's not transparent. Your actions are not transparent to me. But it's a process of communication. And how do we become, begin to be able to uh, transmit, if you want, knowledge, information, um, history. history, everything, practices, all sorts through these codes. So that's what performance was for me. So it was much more than theater. Because theater is one way in which we do that. And performance art is another way that we do that. And sports maybe another way. And maybe religious practice another way. And rituals another way. There's many, many ways. But this transmission of not just codes and understanding, but also affective reactions, like crying mm -hmm. or whatever, that goes through those codes to me seemed absolutely fundamental. And so I've spent my whole life trying to understand it. It's so still that's, trying. I'm still trying. <laughs> yeah. Good. And you make you help us a lot to understand also with uh, your thank books. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. In in the archive and repertoire, 
talking about it, so the the performer, but not the performer as the actor, the trained actor. This mm -hmm. can be the 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 wife on the wedding right. in your example. Right. If uh, the performer holds the repertoire embodied, as you say in your book, yeah. is um, is the performer able to change uh, his own history and culture by uh, reenacting history, for example, or reenacting rituals or creating new rituals? Do you believe this, the, the concrete change? Yes, I think change happens absolutely through enacted behavior. Um, there's some very clear examples. For example, uh, people who have had a traumatic experience, say in a war or in an accident, um, if they repeat some of the actions and repeat them in a slightly different way and so for example one just one very simple example mm -hmm. if you were in a building that was on fire and you were going down the stairs and after that you were terrified of stairs you can't go upstairs mm -hmm. you can't go up elevators right so it's very traumatic so if you do like one step just one step and back and one step and back and then later two steps and back there there becomes a way through the repetition through the enactment where you can start disassociating this terrible traumatic memory from the act itself so that the act can lose its power it can lose its traumatic horrible power um, so that's one example but it's also in very complex political examples Right? You say something over and over again, you do something over and over again, and it becomes a part of you. And so that's why when we hear this terrible um, rhetoric, say for example of hate mm -hmm. against the group or against whatever, right? Uh, against women, against gays, against you know, African diasporic populations. When you hear that, it becomes a part of the psyche. So how do you change that? You do it through repetition of different kinds of behavior mm -hmm. that at the same time try to pull you away from that automatic reaction, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's part of what we need to understand in political performance, right? How... The repetition yeah. makes the, the, yeah. the memory, right. changing memory, right. changing the present right. and the memory. Absolutely, yes. In still in, in embodiment, uh, which I related to, it's really recent. This when I read uh, Varelas and Maturana's cognition theory, I read your book, and then I made I made um, uh, the connection between the embodiment. Mm -hmm. And the book is only a, a little reference for Varelas and Maturana's. Uh -huh. But I'd like to talk about uh, the performer and training to. Ob not only to obtain knowledge about his history and, and his memory and, and uh, make her, uh, acts of resistance, right. but is it possible in this repetition, is, the, is it possible for the, the performer to train, to do it, uh, to make this the more effective performance? Do you believe in training while you're doing the performance? Is it a tr can be a training? Or well, if you I'm put your body on this, in this situation? Right. I'm not sure if um, by training you mean, I mean, everything we do is training, right? Every action mm -hmm. that we do, uh, every repetition is a form of disciplinary training, if we want to put it that way. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if you're asking me if there's a difference between, say, a rehearsal process and then the, the performance uh, process. Yes, I'd like because in rehearse you you're training specifically exactly to do a certain series of acts since the body learns from the real right. experience right i'm trying to think if the real if the real experience is the performance and the, the performer like las madres right they do it every every right. thursday are they right. training to do this action while you're doing it well i guess but i mean they're doing it more than rehearsing uh, They're doing beyond it. Rehearsal. I'm not sure how training helps us. It's not the, the good word. Training. Yeah, I don't think that word perhaps helps us. But it's true that they become um, stronger. They become much more sophisticated in how they do it. Um, but that's a wonderful example, for example, when they are 
doing their Thursday enactment where it channels grief in, in this case in a very political way right so they use that grief and that pain and they make a political demand with it so that's another way in which these codes are very effective in transmitting emotional feeling and for people who are around to mm -hmm. look at them and think yes. you know yeah. it's uh, it's very it's powerful. powerful so I think that that's another example of how that works and the reason that they were able to survive is of, because of because this. they were able to do this right so they had such a terrible terrible pain I mean you can't even imagine right I can't imagine what it would be like for people to come and take my children I just can't imagine so to live with that is almost unbearable and so it's an interesting point that many of the men the fathers could not go to the plaza because when the mother started with the dictatorship and if men had been out there the military would have used as an excuse to just kill them all right so they had to be only women defenseless all of this and so the fathers had a much more difficult time many more committed suicide for example they didn't have a way to channel that grief into something that was productive in a way, right? It built solidarity, mm -hmm. it was a resistance movement, it was a demand on the government, it made the criminality of the government visible, you know, so it had very specific uh, goals and functions. So, in a way, it's life-saving also, right? But if, is there a, a mother that uh, repeats it more? Uh, for example, one mother is doing for five years and one right. mother starts doing it today. Right. Do you think this this the one that is doing it for more more than than once right. is more is train is uh, has the body with the more uh, uh, cognitive knowledge? Yes, on of doing course. this on of doing course. this channel of grief. Of so course. without of course. a rehearse. Yes. Just by doing it. Just by doing it. Okay. Just by doing it. And if you're thinking about cognition, um, in. Um, Certain studies they find that, for example, cognition works through paths. Some people call them memory tracks or different things like mm -hmm. this. That you can actually make different memory tracks okay. through repetition. So through, if you want this process of rehearsal. So that's very important to think. You can get, the, and I was say, kind of saying that with the trauma, that very simple example mm -hmm. of the stairs. Mm -hmm. You can lay a different memory track so that stairs are not automatically that disaster, right? Stairs can be a way of getting you up to another flight, right? So maybe you're training to to make the stairs back to be a stairs and not exactly, the trauma. Exactly, exactly. So, okay. But it's but it's that way even with very sophisticated things yeah. too, right? See, yes. Uh, well, we came here in 2013 and we had, we had a, a very, very uh, short talk on the street while they are doing the Pedra performance. Right. And I thought, I, I, I told you there was a research also, not only perf a performance. Yes. That's yes. why I'm, the, the, the last, the past question was about training. Right. Because in Bogota, when I, when I did the, the work group with uh, Greiner and Asunção, mm -hmm. we talked th those days about performance practice as research. Right. So I'd like you to, to, to Talk, to talk about the difference that you see. You told me that day in Zuccotti that was not per research was something and performance was another thing. Maybe. Did I say that? Yes. It, uh, it got into us uh, for all these years. Maybe. Well. You said the research needs methods and need. You need to know what you yes, want from the research yes, and performance. Yes, I think that's true. I think that's. I still think that that part is true. What I would say is there's something called uh, performance-based research, and that's different. And I do believe in performance-based research. It's based. 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 So okay. you base the research on the performance. So what does this mean? For example, as a methodology, because I do think research needs a methodology, right? Mm -hmm. So as and method performance doesn't need a methodology. It does. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Both of them. Absolutely, it has a methodology. It's a methodology of practice, and then the research would be a kind of a knowing and knowledge production based on that okay. practice, right? So it's related, absolutely, but it's a different step. 
different uh, movement. There's a different movement, perhaps, yeah. So, for example, what does it mean to do scholarship where you, for example, or your group, has to be in that place? When you're in Sukati Park, for example, or you're in Bogota, or you're in, right? So there's something that's very different about you being there in Sukati Park than, for example, just knowing that Occupy Wall Street had a lot of its base in Zuccotti Park. So what do you know differently when you're there? And how does that become important in terms of your research? Those are questions that I think are very important, especially if you're thinking about performance, because performance is not, um, especially performance practice, embodied practice. Um, it's not a photograph. You can have a photograph of the practice, but it's not the practice. Um, it's not a chapter in a book. It's not, it's something else. So how do you understand what that is? And part of it is to understand it means that we engage with it. So that means I am personally engaged with your work, for example, if I'm thinking about it or writing about it. Um, and so to communicate that to somebody else, I have to say what you do. I have to describe it. I have to describe what the what the practice does, what it wants to do, how it engages spectators, all of these other things. So my method as a research person, when I'm faced with practice, obliges me to do very different things than the scholar of a literary text or the scholar of a of a film, you know, cinema studies or other studies that have very stable objects. Mm -hmm. Because you can go back and you can look at the film and you can say, oh, I agree with Diana or I don't agree with Diana. This is actually, I think something else is going on there. But if I say this is what uh, Erdogan was doing in, in uh, Sakari Park, nobody can go back and say that's what they were doing or not doing or that's what the police were doing when they came up and started talking to you, or that was a reaction of the people who were around and wanting to think about what you were doing, and you know all of that interesting stuff that was happening on the street. right? So that's a whole different level of, of work that research has to do to think about and to deal with performance. Um, and then you can think about other things. You can think about um, interpretations. You can think about bodies as knowing, and bodies know in very complex ways. And we have to figure out how that is and how that works. So I think it's they're related, but they're not an identical project. Mm -hmm. the, the, the performer is, which is, was holding the, the, the stone. who was holding the stone. Mm -hmm. He's not researching that time. He's performing. Mm -hmm. His body performing. is performing. His body's performing. He cannot be researching. He's not researching in that way. He can be a witness to himself, a spectator to himself, and say, "This is what it feels like." And this is what people are doing when they're watching me. And <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and out of the corner of my eye, I see a policeman over there that looks like he doesn't know what I'm doing and is very curious and maybe a little threatened. I have a stone with, you know. So all of these things are happening in the performer. But I think then later you say, well, or you can think, was it? Um, what I thought was going to happen, what did I think was going to happen, what happened, uh, what connections were made that weren't there before, or what do I understand about that space I didn't understand before? What do other people understand about that space that they didn't understand before they saw us, like statues holding those rocks, right? So I think mm -hmm. that different kinds of questions become possible. Okay, so we had, uh, we, had, we, we could uh, had, uh, make a lot of questions, do the performance, and then meet, and then try to be to be to, to be researching exactly. about what we did. Exactly. We, we need yes. a lot of steps, not only perform. We right. only need to perform. Right. Yes, okay. no, exactly. Yeah. As we hold the, the repertoire in our bodies, if you disagree, what I'm I'm yes. putting what I understood yes. from the book. Yes. Uh, we become a performance. So again, um, I'll change the, the, the word next time, but as we training the, the cultural past and present uh, memory of history in our bodies as as the history I understand the history is is on, on fluxes it's mm -hmm. 
it's it's in on movement. Right. So it's on movement on my body also. Right. But when I when I when I put my my body on on the on the spot on uh -huh. action, am I uh, becoming a co uh, this uh, this um, this body that is holding the repertoire in the moment? I'm creating the repertoire, right? Right. With well, other bodies. Mm -hmm. What what I thought about the repertoire was not exactly not exactly that in the sense that for example um, we have a huge enormous cultural repertoire that we draw from all the time right how do we sit how are we sitting here the way that we're sitting here is maybe different than the way we would be sitting in a movie theater say maybe in the movie theater would be whatever right I mean mm -hmm. there's zillions of examples so what we do the acts that we do, learning how to walk, learning how to hold a pen, learning how to eat, you know, manners, all of that, that's all part of a cultural repertoire. And we have our own, if you want our own, I don't know what that means exactly, but own in the sense of, well, I come from this particular community. So in my community, this is how people hold their knives and forks. And I was trained, you know, very strictly to sit up straight and to do this and this. That's the repertoire of that community that I was trained in. But my body also has a lot of other ones, right? I go to the movies, I go to restaurants, I go to different countries. I know that in this country I can, you know, maybe with my fingers or tacos in Mexico or, you know, however. So the repertoire is now one. It's a huge, it's a huge repository living. I don't want to say repository because that makes it sound like it's still. And like stable, it's not. It's moving, right? Uh, and it moves through bodies. That all moves through bodies. And we don't all pull from the same. So part of your repertoire, or your cultural uh, memory, if you want, might be the way that you did something with your mother or your father, or an aunt. Like I think about, you know, cooking. You know, cooking is a cultural repertoire and it goes in families and you know I cook and my children cook and we cook together and we're cooking some recipes that we've learned from my grandmother and other ones I learned over here and other ones that we like from over so these are transmissions through the body that are not necessarily even consciously thought of and sometimes not even valued so we can say well that community they don't have any cultural products or practice because they don't have books where they don't have, uh, you know, their uh, written language, right? And they have their songs, and they have their rituals, and they have their ways of harvesting crops and planting, and they have a huge repertoire. But you don't think about that, and that's my argument in that book. If you only value what's written, mm -hmm. and the Eurocentric way of thinking about knowledge is knowledge that comes in books and is transmitted through books. So you can separate the person who knows, say, I'm the scholar, so I write this, right? And then the book is published and it gets transmitted. Somebody else can read it in 100 years. And those lines are still there. So there's a separation mm -hmm. between the knower and what is known. But in the repertoire, you can't separate the knower from the known. It's an act of transfer. If mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to say. If, mm -hmm. if a dancer is, uh, is going to India and... and, and learn katakali and then goes to to peru and learn uh and works with yashikani for example and then goes to brazil and studies samba is he becoming a reper uh, cultural repertoire in the body no no, no. because of no, learning he's this? accessing he's accessing okay. different repertoires and it may be in a very superficial way it may be mm -hmm. that he knows how to dance samba or it may be in a very profound way in a way that's very, um, um, that becomes very much a part of, of that body. I mean, Grotowski was trying to do that, yes, right? Yes. That was his thing. I mean, make it so deep, make it so a part of your body. Um, so it can be, any, but that is through the training and the repetition and the internalization, if you want, of these. Yeah. Yeah, Boal says that uh, we all, uh, have the 
theater, he said about theater, yes. the theater language on our routine, yeah. but we are not conscious about it. Right. And the actor, he talks about the actor, yeah. is uh, conscious. Right. And then he says that the, the theater of the oppressed is giving uh, this conscious to the people to exactly. know that they already are theater. Yeah. He talks about this, yeah. we are theater. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to I say. I think that's exactly right. I think that's, I completely agree with Juan. And, and we are, he says, you know, we're actors and spectators and everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very important, so you see for a research question that's based on that premise, that's a fantastically important observation of his. Okay. So you see things, but you can see them from different positions. If you're doing it, you know, if you're taking the position of the actor and I'm the spectator, that's a certain relationship and, and we can see certain things. But then if all of a sudden I'm the actor and you're the spectator or we confuse it and we can see it from different points of view, now you're the actors, I'm the spectator, then that gives us a broader way of what we can see and the framework becomes larger in which we can understand problems, right? And so I see it very much in terms of framework that, for example, um, a theater piece is one kind of strict framework. Usually if you have a proscenium stage or, you know, you have to start at 8 and it finishes at 10, or, you know, it's quite structured. Um, but the more that you see the theater happening within the sala, and the sala that's located in a barrio or in a place, and the people who are coming and going, and people seeing each other from, I'm seeing the person who's sitting next to me. What are they wearing? Are they rich? Are they poor? Should they be here? I don't like them. Uh, or, you know, do I feel, oh my God, I shouldn't be here. They're so fancy or, you know, whatever, right? So all of this is going on all the time. And so you have to, if you have a broader framework, then you think about the economic situation. Who has money to be there? Who doesn't have money to be here? What kind of a barrio? When I leave this space and I go outside, if I leave the sala, what's out on the street? Who's watching who, you know? And so you can ask more and more questions. And so, and better and better questions, I think. So I think that that framework is a really important thing, and mm -hmm. while I think plays with it in a very, yeah, when, when you, very you, important way. When you're saying about the audience sitting next to each other, but also yeah. about the spec act actors, yeah, uh, and we are living on the <coughs> on a on a, on a period that uh, the art is becoming uh, more interactive. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you don't even know, right. who, or there doesn't exist the performer. Yeah. There are all uh, yeah. audit people yeah. doing things. Yeah. And uh, do you think this is also a, a, a way to to get to embody knowledge? Absolutely. Even though you're not the, even though you're just entering an interactive performance. Absolutely. And do you do you think uh, there is a difference between seated audience and uh, active audience or? I think, it's, I think it's a very different thing. Oh, okay. I think they're very different things. And I agree with Rancière that uh, seeing, watching is also a doing. I agree with him that we don't have a passive audience. I completely agree with that. But I also think that there's something very important when people leave their chairs and start doing, you know, work on the floor, for example, participating. I think mm -hmm. you have a different experience. That doesn't mean that. I don't believe we should have theater and stages or music and concert halls. I do. They're different. It's a very different experience. They do a lot, but they do different things. Okay. So. Uh, I mean, would you, for example, <coughs> in that uh, piece that you did in Zuccotti Park, in the, in the Piedra, Pedra piece, what if somebody else came and took a rock and stood next to you? Would that be something you would welcome? Yes. Not welcome. So the ideal would be more and more people joining and becoming part of this and doing something mm -hmm. that even you didn't envision necessarily. Yes. So there's something that's very powerful about that, right? Yes, we always uh, celebrate when people get yeah. the action yeah. uh, along or more than the actors, yeah. the performers. Yeah. But hence, here problematizes this, this for us on the street. Because on the street, uh, everyone is active, no one's sitting. And when we think about the scene as a, also a participation, 
before the group was always researching and not sitting, not no seeing. We are always seeking yeah. the not non sitting right. audience. Right. So when she comes to for us, it's a it's an important thing to think. Sometimes not yeah. not being active is also a, a way to be participating in a, in a, in, a, in yeah. another way. Yeah, and I think I think he's right. I think he really is right. So the the act uh, you talk about acts of resistance, not only mm -hmm. acts of transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, since I know uh, yeah. your research about the the, the las madres and right. hijos, you think resist is to transform is to to transformate. Is a transformation the resistance, or is uh. just a, a, a blocking? <coughs> I think it's not necessarily a transformation. It definitely can be. I think it's everything. Um, so resistance, if we think about what resistance means, um, resistance has like a very broad range of possibilities. Like for example, the one very famous example from Latin America was with uh, colonization that um, the attitude, and there's a saying for this in Spanish, I'll say it in Spanish, but I'm sure you'll understand it in, in Portuguese. They say, obedezco, pero no cumplo. Do you know what that means? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, my form of do. resistance. Okay, oh yeah, you want me to do that? Sure, great, no problem. I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. Right, so do I transform the situation? Maybe. Um, then you have another one which uh, Deserto talks about in the practice of everyday life. He calls it bricolage, mm -hmm. but it's like uh, slowing down the machine. So it can be machine as work, as an office work, as what we need to accomplish, um, or it could be a machine, right? So you just slow it down. So I'm not going to say to you, my boss, I'm not going to do it. Well, so I'll do it, I'll do it. And something that would normally take me one hour, it's going to take me a whole day, or maybe two days. Okay, I'm slowing down the machine. So is that transforming? And then you have some that, or like the madres. I mean, they're resistant, they transformed. But it took years and years and years and years and years. So sometimes resistance can lead to transformation. Sometimes it can lead, um, you know, like the Zapatistas, the quite radical transformation. Mm -hmm. So it depends. I, I don't think that there's a one way or one thing, but I think that even, for example, uh, communities that speak their native languages, that's, a form, of, that's, is a, transformation. that's a form of, of resistance and transformation, mm -hmm. right? Perfect. And even, uh, but sometimes the social movement uh, see performers that are too aestheticized, mm -hmm. not, uh, are not the, the prostitute by itself, but has a lot of uh, spectacular elements. Yeah. Do you do? You, I I know your work doesn't doesn't have a lot of differences between this because you put right. the ritual as as everything, but I'd like you to talk about this uh, in a world that is monetized, is right. everything is has a, a static, not mm -hmm. a static. Do you think it's, do you see more uh, effectiveness in a, in a protest that with like Las Madres, more than a protest like uh, a performance like Pedra, for example, because there is an artistic... Right, okay. Um, so I think that obviously the work that interests this, that interests me is the work that falls between the aesthetic, if you want, the art and the activist. So that's what interests me the most. But I speak to a lot of artists. I work with a lot of artists and I work with a lot of activists. And almost all of them will say it's not the same thing. And even some of the people I consider the most radical artists say that they're artists and not activists. So I say, why? What's the difference? And one of the answers that I got from uh, Regina Jose Galindo in Guatemala, who's uh -huh. wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. She said, an activist sets out to bring about a change in policy. Okay, we don't want any more, uh, say, pollution. We want to close down this plant. 
Um, we want to do something about the laws with guns, so not everybody has guns, right? So you have a very specific goal, and you work towards that goal, and whatever you do is either successful or not successful. It's efficacious or it's not efficacious. Did it achieve its goal, yes or no? That's how Very clean. That's how activists usually see their work. And she says artists, and she's speaking for herself, but I thought it was very good, and other people have, have agreed with this. Artists don't feel that they're changing a specific thing. That their goal is much less uh, objective, direct, okay. directed, and or idios idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And so she is as political a person as I know, and as brave and as whatever. But she doesn't ever ask herself if the performance was efficacious or not efficacious. Was it successful or not? She says no. That's not the question that you bring to art. You can't bring that question to art. So we could talk about what art does. Does it move you? Does it change consciousness? You know, does it move you immediately? Does it move you over time? Some things take many years for it to really you start understanding what that art was about, right? So it's there are different questions. And um, one of the things I've noticed working at the Hemispheric Institute where we work with artists and activists and scholars is that the activists get very impatient with artists. They get very yes, impatient. We feel that uh, Yeah. They don't they don't understand the nature of the work that artists do. And so a lot of the discussions are about that. That art, for example, can bring about very deep change of consciousness. Very, 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 very profound, right? Um, so no, the artist does not limit herself or himself to this specific, I'm gonna change this policy. It's much bigger than that. It's not the same result. You cannot no. uh, ask the artist to have the same right. result. But one of the things I love the most is when I see artists and activists working together. And that's incredible, because activists need artists. Forget about it. You need expressive culture. You need people who know how to uh, do something that has an impact, visual, emotional, how to use these codes I was talking about earlier, but in an aesthetic way, mm -hmm. right? How to make that intervention. Activists may have you know, the fabulous ideas, but where is that sense of of the power of, of the doing, right? So I think the best work is when they work together. Perfect. So uh, maybe I rephrased the, the question so it's easy to, uh, yeah. to edit. Yeah. Well, we, talk, we are talking about the body in action, uh, present physical presence, and there are a lot of um, uh, performance practices that are taking out the body, even though uh, I think the, yeah, faking that the ID, right? If, if, but the final thing is the media, but there is a body doing it, right? And we are talking up in in Sao Paulo in the work group in line and offline. How is this changing this the body presence, right. the, the right. internet? Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to uh, to ask you if you could talk about what you think about the, the difference between performance with the physical presence of the body concrete and the, the the practice that are taking out the body if it is if it is, is it possible to take out the body from away from the performance practice? well I think it's impossible to do it completely because even if it's online and digital somebody's putting in whatever has to be put in right so the body is there somehow maybe the body's not what's seen online and that's an important distinction I would say I'm one of these people who believe in everything you know, there's some people who believe in nothing, <laughs> and there's some people who believe in everything, and it's the same thing, except one is more optimistic a vision than yeah. the other. And so my my view of things is, yes, the stuff that happens on the digital can be fantastic and very powerful. It's not exactly the same. So it goes back to what I've said before, right? It's a it's a different it's a different thing. Um, so for example. <coughs> The kind of intervention that yes men can make 
by doing something online. Like we did something online, Jacques and I, where we did something against Monsanto. And it was great. And there was nobody on the digital thing. It wasn't like the Dow chemical where they're using the no. internet, uh, they're using the television, right? To, mm -hmm. So, or in the Chamber of Commerce where there's the face-to-face. -face. So this was, there was nobody. And it had a huge impact, that performance. Was it the same as the performance that we did on the street or a different kind of performance? No, it was very different. Um, it was efficacious because it did what we needed it to do. We slowed down Monsanto in Mexico. So that was huge. But the performance where you have bodies, where there's people, you have a lot of other things that are going on, right? Even if you're talking about efficacy, there's still a lot of other things that are going on. So for example, one of the things that happens is, say you're in a protest, and you're all together. There's a sense of solidarity that builds up. There's a sense that gives you kind of enthusiasm, gives you more hope, because physically you're not alone, you're with other people. So all of this stuff is transmitting body to body, right? You don't get that if you're doing this online. You don't get that. You don't get that physical sense of empowerment, really, of being with other people, and pleasure of being able to protest with other people, and to feel that you've created a community in the face of forces that you think are kind of overwhelming, but they don't feel so overwhelming when you're all together on the street. So there's, that's what I'm saying, that the things that happen through the body carry a lot of additional things. So yes, I, I learn a huge amount through books. I read them all the time, that's not the problem. But I learn other things by being in with through bodies, interacting. And that's what I was saying about um, the kinds of things that we learn through performance or through embodiment, being there. I learn a huge amount that I don't learn by doing this. I learn a huge amount here that I don't learn by being... In contact. Yeah, so they're different things. and. I, I like to think of it as more of an extension of all the things that we are, rather than either or. It's not this, or it's not that. It's everything combined, you know? And we're much more than the sum of the parts. Perfect. So, getting to, from this point, it seems to me that you don't, you don't separate uh, reality and fiction. Uh, for example, when 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 we when you just said uh, there is a uh, there's uh, there's knowledge that is is passing through bodies, and it can be cooking or it can be doing a, a theater play, and we we tend to say no theater play has fiction, less reality and cooking is more reality, and I I I'm, I really want to ask you if you make distinctions between reality and I fiction do. or it is I do. I do. Talk I, about it? Yes, I think it's very important um, to understand that there's certain things that maybe I would call facts mm -hmm. rather than reality. So facts are, for example, did slavery exist in the Americas? Yes. Did, however, hundreds and thousands of millions of Africans get brought over to the Americas to do hard labor? Yes. Were the 95% of indigenous peoples in the Americas dead within 50 years of the conquest? Yes. Right? These are all facts. And I think it's very important to remember those facts. You know, does one quarter of 1% of the population own 50% of the resources of this mm -hmm. earth? Yes. Those are facts. And they're really important facts. And those are the things that um, I think make it important to keep bringing back facts. Um, I was with a journalist a couple of days ago, o o uh, Oscar Martinez, who did this mm. work on migration. Mm. And he writes in his book, journalism has its effect by the same way the, the ocean does on the rock, by going back by d again and again and again and again, right? You try to get people to understand that these are the facts. I think reality is very, very complex. So I don't think that the virtual is not reality. The virtual is reality. It's part of our reality. It's a more complex reality. Um, 
for example, I don't think the dreams are not part of our reality. They are a part of who we are, and they're a part of our reality. Some people, some communities, some indigenous communities, for example, put a lot of meaning in dreams, and they are guided by them. That's very real. You're not going to tell, I mean, right? It's real. So I think it depends on what we mean by what reality is. Um, so in a theater play, you can say the subject matter may be fiction. Mm -hmm. That's right. What's happening before you, is there a play happening there? Yes, that's real. If an actor on stage falls and breaks a leg, that's real, right? So there's not an absolute distinction between these levels. They're very interconnected. But they are different. What you say is they, they don't, they're not, not always together, reality. It's fiction. not always together, no. No, and there's a term uh, that's being used called parafiction, para which is something like the yes men do, okay. right? That's kind of parafiction. So they're saying that um, they are the Chamber of Commerce and they're trying to do the right thing, and the people from the Chamber of Commerce say, no, you're not us, and no, we're not going to support environmental uh, legislation. Right. Um, so the way that they're saying the as if, as if it were true, is like an aspiration. It's not not true. It's that this is not what they're going to do because they're a very bad organization. Mm -hmm. But it makes the reality visible in a way that the corporation may not make that reality visible. Because the reality, they're complicating everything and they're saying, yes, yes, they're doing it. And they're not doing it, right? So um, the way that something that's not true can tell more of the truth than the truth is actually a very important part of all the work that we all do, right? Yes. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Well, in disappearing acts that you, you organize, it's, for me, it started to have this um, concept of the performance re-disappearing and disappearing that you go deeper in the, in the right. archive and repertoire. Right. And I was thinking that we always, it's just common sense that the theater is an ephemeral, has this right. ephemeral characteristic that it's over right. when it's over. Right. But when you talk about this re-disappearing in the performance is always, it's appearing as it disappears in right. in this communication right. between two, two or right. more people, it seems it becomes eternal. In a way that uh, when I throw it to you, you ha you hold it and then you throw it again. It never ends. It right. seems. Yeah, right. I'd like to, because this is the, totally the opposite of the common sense in theater. Oh, it's over. Right. Yeah, no, it's not over, right? That's not over. So, and it's not over on lots of different levels. So it's not over in the spectators, because when you leave, you have something. It may be pleasure. It may be displeasure. It may be something that you're thinking about you haven't thought before maybe a connection, something that reminds you. So something's going on. It may be the start of something else. So that's on one very basic level. But even if you think about theater, think about um, just the most obvious right now is uh, Shakespeare. Only the most obvious because it's the 400th celebration and you know, yes, the year, and yes. so it's everywhere. So if you think about Shakespeare, everybody's still doing Shakespeare. Right? People know Shakespeare better than uh, they know much else in their lives. Not everybody, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not everybody, but the people who mm -hmm. do theater, right? So things like some of the moral dilemmas that Shakespeare introduces or concepts like the world is a stage, right? They're so deep in our way of thinking about our consciousness and about life and about what's real, the your question about what's real. I mean, what he's saying is something that other people have said is that art can be more real than life. It can be truer, like Garto, the theater in its double, right? The double is life, theater is what's, right? So there's ways of, of thinking about expressive culture, these practices that get to the very essence of what we think life means. So very eternal questions. So in that way, they're eternal. And some of these great artists also give us some of the language to talk about that. They give us a vocabulary to think about or an image to think about, to think with, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a framework that would help us bring that, f that question or that issue out in a way that we can recognize. A little what Brecht said, right? You take something that's familiar and all of a sudden you make it unfamiliar. 
so that you can see it again. Say, oh my God, that's really true. That's how it is, right? So it has all of these ways of, of changing our perception, if you want, in a very real way. So I think in that sense... Change reality. Change perception, you change reality. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Right. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 not at all. Okay, um, we are working on debate and the distinctions between debate and dissent. Our, our uh, work in this project is ending now, and uh, the question is, is it possible to have debate on the play? So that's why we came to see Boal, because Boal right. do, does the, the Forum Theater, for example, right. it's, it's a debate on the, on the play. Yeah. Which yeah. goes right, and I'd like to maybe you s you bring an example that you saw as a per well, one performance that uh, uh, explodes in debate or something that you think about is performance uh, debate uh, body uh, debate with bodies. Right, I don't know. It's just something. Well, okay, so I'll give you one example, the one that just most immediately comes up, that happened at the Encuentro in Montreal in 2014. And that was uh, about a performance that Jesus Rodriguez and her partner Liliana Felipe did. And the play had like two main, two main goals. One was, what it was about was about um, an 18th century woman named Juana who was intersex. She was a hermaphrodite. And the Inquisition, this was in Guatemala, the Inquisition had accused her of having sex with women and then they were going to kill her. She, I mean, she would be executed, right? So there's a big debate about that in the time and they send a doctor to examine her physically. <clears throat> and the doctor says she can't have raped women because she's neither a man nor a woman. She is neutral. She's nothing. Well, Jesus had heard that story and it's all the argumentation and it's all in the archive and it's all in the archives of the Inquisition, right? That they're dealing with gender and sexuality and all of this and she thought this was fantastic. So she and her partner put on this performance called Juana La Larga. So Juana La Larga um, shows a, uh, an examining table, a table like this, and there is a, a mannequin, like a medical mannequin. And so the doctor, who Jesus does brilliantly, is like, you know, in his little velvet slippers, and he's like, well, no, but, you know, examine, in the violence of the examination, and the violence of that kind of medicalization of the body, and all of that, the, um, the conquest also because colonialism, because it's a Spanish doctor that gets called in, and of course she's a, a mestiza woman, and you know, there's so many, so many, so many layers. Okay, wow. so what interested Jesus about this was this thing that the doctor says, she's not a man or a woman, she's a nothing. And the point for Jesus was that women have been nothing in Mexico and in Latin America for a very long time and the violence against women is constant. And there's this reminder during the play of how many women are killed every day and how many women are being killed just even during the duration of the play. That was her, that was her main point. So um, there was huge applause. Everything she does is also very funny. I don't know if you know the word. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I mean, it's yes, hilariously it's nice. funny. Uh -huh. So people were laughing and laughing and so forth. And anyway, everybody was very happy, it seems, we left. And then the next day on Facebook, um, there was a post from a transgender man saying that Jesusa had made fun of trans people and that he felt completely violated that when people laughed in the audience they felt that they were laughing at him and at other trans people and there was a huge explosion. So that explosion lasted during the whole encuentro, that's all the people talked about and it, and I writ, I've written about it. I wrote about it in the journal on uh, uh, gender and sexuality. And uh, other people were writing about it. And I mean, it just went on and on and on and on. And so it ignited this huge debate about, first of all, 
um, the trans debate is a relatively new one, even in the United States and Canada. And it's lived, it's not so, so new. I mean, in Mexico, there's trans communities, the, the Mushe, for example, an indigenous community where certain men oh, yes, were always brought up as women. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, so there's different practices in different parts of the world and so forth. And uh, so part of it was the arrogance of this now man from Canada, extraordinarily wealthy, I mean, from a family that owns like half of the world, sitting there saying that he felt so injured, you know, by these Latin American women who are doing this thing, which is about violence against women at the end of the day. So people were saying, well, he was arrogant and he was a first worlder and it turned into a problem between the first world and the third world. And then in, in the piece I wrote, I said, it's not so simple because there is indigenous people for example, in Canada, one of the keynotes was this wonderful guy named Highway Thompson, who is um, a queer, indigenous Cree man from the Cree nation in the northern part of Canada, who gave the most brilliant thing. And he was dismantling the whole Western notion of gender and sexuality and these binaries and everything. And so, so, so he and Jesus have much more in common, even though um, you know, one is, quote, mm -hmm. north and south or whatever. So those distinctions are, are stupid, I find, and I find that, not stupid, they're too easy, they're too simplistic, and um, it's very important, I think, to try to figure out how people are talking and what they're trying to communicate rather than everybody immediately getting offended and immediately, mm -hmm. you know, taking sides. And so, I mean, I've seen so many of those performances I where, imagine. Yeah, so many, and you know, something happens and boom, because you have a thousand people there, and a thousand people in quite a lot of proximity, right? So it's like everybody then starts talking about it, and then, so yeah, it's very important, and you can start thinking about, I mean, there really is a side of consciousness changing, right? Mm -hmm. Because I had to hear, and she had to hear why some of the members of the trans community were upset. And she had to explain why that was not her intention, but she certainly did not intend to hurt them. That was not her intention. So where were those places where, you know, there could have been a misunderstanding or something that didn't mm -hmm. work the way she thought it was working? And so it also becomes this occasion for this other kind of dialogue and interaction. Perfect. Since you were uh, <coughs> uh, a, a long time ago, doing performance studies in the institution, educational institution. I'd like to know if you have an, a, a critique about uh, the formation of a young, a young person that wants to be, to do performance, for example. Performance or performance studies? No, performance. Performance. For the artist, an artist uh, formation. Mm -hmm. What is, what, what does a young person needs to do? Is it the university or is I don't the think community. there's any one way. I don't think there's any one way. I think what the young person needs to have is an enormous commitment, because it's not easy, an enormous clarity of purpose, why are they doing what they're doing, um, and then training themselves for whatever it is that they are going to do. So that may mean, you know, uh, kind of conservatory training, it may mean being out in the fields, mm -hmm. you know, picking up the stones or working with indigenous communities or learning different instruments. I mean, who knows, right? It depends mm -hmm. on what that project is. What is the project? Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I think you do need, I always think, one of the things that's very important is that artists need to be uh, very clear about what they're doing. Because I think that um, a lot of people that I speak to, especially young people, are very, um, are suffering and are really at a disadvantage because they're not clear what it is that they want to do. So what kind of an intervention do you want to make? I don't know, I mean, they want to be famous maybe, or they want to have a company, but they don't know how. I say you can't wait around for somebody to give you a company. You know, mm -hmm. whatever you're going to do, you are going to have to do it. So you have to be clear that this is what you want and not this. Because if you want to do this and you're doing this, you're never going to get, you know. So I think that part of it is not to depend so much on the outside. 
and to say, this is where I want to make my, my intervention. Mm -hmm. The last question. Uh, I think it's, it's a delicate issue. I don't have an answer. And I, I always see this coming up in the encuentros. And we never talked about it, so I'm using right. the interview yeah. to have a, this question. We came here and watched the, the archive from Boal. Right. And once they were repertoire, because they, are n they were yes. not on putting on the official any right. a, uh, server, and uh, now we are transforming it again in the repertoire, I think. Right. When I, we watch and we right. get influenced by this, right. this archive, right. we're going to do a performance that right. is not an archive. It right. This makes a movement, yes. I think, from the repertoire yes. to the archive. Yes. And always, uh, and I don't agree, but uh, the hemispheric is, is, is located in the US. Right. And Latin America has a lot of conflicts with the imperialist way right. of the, the, right. the American po uh, of international policies. Of course. And for us, it's really important to, to, to continue this relationship, but sometimes we get criticized, uh, right. we receive a critique to, to still come in here. Right. And, and uh, uh, we feel that we are taken out again. So me, uh, as a Brazilian, watching Boal, so I'm doing the... I'm taking it back in a way. We are taking right, it back. Right. Even though it's here, we are taking it back. Okay. Not the uh, physical taking it back, but uh, right. we're taking it back uh, in the image <coughs> that we saw, the, 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 the learnings that we heard. Yeah. So how do you, how do you put the answer to, to people are going to watch this video and I think it's mm -hmm. a very easy way to criticize right. the hemispheric. Right. To say that, uh, oh, okay, and I see... Uh, we cannot change things from outside. We gotta be inside, and uh, right. like, uh, but like your opinion on this issue. Right. So no, it's a very important. Sometimes this no, it's a very important issue. It's a very important issue, and I don't forget it one single day. So, <clears throat> I just want to say one thing about the archive that you're seeing. We don't have that archive. So those videos which are already, if you want, archival. You know, I mean, it's already a video, it's not a repertoire. Those videos um, came from Brazil. We did the digitalization and the preservation and the vid videos went oh, back okay. to Brazil. So we don't keep anything. We want to call it the anti-colonial archive right. because we don't work with originals. We don't want your originals. We want the originals in your country and we want you to be able to look after them. So we're very clear about that. What we want to do is we want to facilitate communication and knowledge among all of us. And one of the ways that we can do that is by sharing the work that we all do. So I completely agree that the US is the empire and the empire is very possibly a very evil empire in many of the things that it does. I have no illusions about that. At the same time, because I work here and I want to use all the resources that I can from here and anything that we can get from here to share throughout the Americas. But all the collaborators are from throughout the Americas. I don't work, not even mainly, with people from the United States. So I think one of the realities of this world is that we are in a very globalized world where everything is crossing all the time, you know, money and armaments and military support and drugs and some people and not other people who are not allowed to cross borders and we have all of this all the time. So I don't think it makes sense to isolate ourselves from these mechanisms. I think for me it makes sense to get myself into that mechanism and to try to do the other kind of transfer which is not weapons and not armaments, not drugs, not bad politics, to say all those people who are interested in working together, artists, activists, and scholars, to change the world for a better place, to make it a more, for social justice, we should work together because all the bad people are already working together, <laughs> right? Yes. And with, as far as the money, which is a big issue, all the money that we've ever had to support the work that we do here is money that I have 
got from uh, grant writing, you know, when you, because the government here doesn't give anything. You have to go through foundations. And those foundations also have terrible histories. Like for example, the Ford, the Ford was Ford Motor and they had very bad politics. And 60 or 65 or maybe even 70 years ago now, I don't know, um, the foundation broke off from Ford Motor Company mm -hmm. and the money goes to progressive politics. That's all it does. It gives that money, whatever the money it has, and it goes to social justice. The one topic, the only one topic that uh, Ford deals with now is inequality. How do we face the issue of inequality? Um, the same thing with the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation came from this enormous wealth. And you know that people like the Rockefellers and the Guggenheims and the Ford Motor, all of that money was made from the exploitation of labor. Nobody gets rich like that on their own, right? So all that money then becomes a part of foundation which has a very different politics. So I think it's fine to use that money. I don't use money from Coca-Cola. I don't use money from Monsanto. But I think it's fine to use money from those foundations because they want us to be able to do these other things that we do. So I think that's an honest partnership. I think there's some very dishonest partnerships. Now the other thing is nobody in Latin America has ever given any money to the Hemispheric Institute. And we have asked, we have asked. But we have a different problem in Latin America, which I think Latin America also has to talk about when we're criticizing um, these financial structures. Is that we have very, very, very wealthy people in Latin America that don't give any money. So one of the wealthiest people in Mexico, well, the wealthiest man in Mexico, one of the wealthiest people in the world, Hank Slim. Carlos Slim. Carlos Slim gives no money, nothing. I mean, he gives a million dollars or something. Which is, for him, it's like me giving 10 cents. Yes. Right? So what is it about that mentality that you're not going to use the resources that were made in those countries, exploiting those populations, to help those populations archive their own goods, their own productions, bring people together, invite artists, invite... Why not invest, if you're using that language, in your own populations? And that's the way it is throughout all of Latin America. So if we do it here, it's because we're able to get the money to do it, and otherwise we couldn't do it. Is it worth trying to get together artists and scholars and activists? I think so. And you know, one of the things I've learned, some of the people I've learned the most from in my life are the Zapatistas. I've been very involved with Zapatista communities. And as you can plainly see mm -hmm. from all our stuff here, um, but one of the things that I learned from the Zapatistas is that you don't have to be indigenous to be a Zapatista. Subcomandante Marcos was not yes. indigenous. Their rule is you have to dedicate yourself completely to indigenous rights. That's the thing. They say there's many indigenous people who do not support indigenous rights, who won't fight for that. And the most remarkable thing that I heard from one of the Zapatistas was that he felt that Noam Chomsky, a professor at MIT, who in relationship financially with the Zapatista is like a multimillionaire, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he makes dollars in the United States at MIT. He's a very important person. He says that he feels that Noam Chomsky is more of a friend to the Zapatistas than a lot of other people who think that they're politically active. active. And that for me was so profound because we get so caught up, I think, on identity politics. Right, I'm this, I'm gonna support that. I'm gonna, and it's like, no, life is too short. I think people who are creative and who want to work together and want to try to bring about some change, we have to do that. And if we're gonna help each other and dialogue with each other, then we have to do that. I'm not going to not say anything because somebody says, oh, well, no, because, you know. Yes. I don't accept it. I just don't accept it. They don't <clears> have to participate. But I don't accept that that's a way that we're going to get things done. And I saw a very concrete example uh, in the in the what's performance studies mm -hmm. when you and Marco say about the translation of the world, the embodiment, right. when you encourage people to talk about, even though the term is not, uh, right. cannot uh, deal with the whole embodiment meaning, yeah. you say in, on the book, 
you should use corporalidades, corporalidades as your word right. to, to talk about this thing. For right. me, it's very important. Yeah. And the other thing is, in Brazil, we wouldn't be able to see boas. It would take so long and such bureaucracy, and maybe no one would believe a, a street theater group right. to watch that or let as you, you, as you hear. But you can watch it. I mean, all, all of that is open access and it's free. So you yes, can watch it on idea. any computer, on any computer anywhere. What you need is, is a certain perfect. amount of bandwidth, you know, yes. but like in an internet cafe or like that, you can watch it. It's all free. The one thing, and all the people who created the work own the rights to the work. So we don't own it. Boaz's family owns it. Perfect. Or Teatro Primido owns it. I mean, that organization owns it. Um, what we ask is the right, the non-exclusive right, to show it, to make it available like this for free online, mm -hmm. in non-downloadable formats. So you can't download it. So if you want to buy that video, if you want to use it in a movie, then you go to Bois to Family the or to the foundation, and they will give you permission, and they will give you the materials, and that's, it's theirs. Perfect. So I think it's very hard to, to try to live an um, anti- uh, colonial life in a very colonialist, world. imperialist mm -hmm. world, um, and nothing is perfect. I mean, one of the things that Jacques Servan from Yes Men says, I go on an airplane. That's against the environment. I'm working for the environment. He says, life is full of contradictions, and it is impossible, he says, to live a completely ethical life. Our society, our capitalist society, doesn't allow it, right? Whenever you're eating certain food, it comes from someplace. Whenever mm -hmm. you're eating, you know, I've stopped eating animals, but you know, people who eat animals, though, that comes from someplace, right? I mean, so it's impossible. So we have to accept contradiction. And if we're looking for purity, that we're gonna live the pure life, it doesn't exist. I mean, that's, and I think that's more dangerous than it is to say, life is super complicated and we do the best we can and we work with the most talented and fabulous people that we know. And that's what we do. And not only that, we have a really fun time doing it. <laughs> and that's great. Yes. I mean, what else can you ask of life, right? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Diana, for Thank your you. time. Thank you. I hope you liked the interview, and we're going to put it online. Well, let me see not it first. Not downloadable. Yes, I mean, I, don't, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.